I'm trying to own every projection so much that I'm not even projecting. It's time to start. <laughs> Which is probably a loving projection. <laughs> hi, everyone. It's been... Hi. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been up here officially. Um, and probably before I start, I would like to just talk about that um, briefly, why I have chosen to not be teaching um, for a while. Uh, if you remember back in the middle of this year, Asia and I went to Greece for about six weeks and we did some teaching there together, which the majority of it I really enjoyed. I loved it and it's definitely um, my passion to talk about divine truth with the world. Um, but what I realised in the process was that there was still a lot of projection coming out of my soul about certain topics <laughs> that I didn't want to talk about. And um, I was actually living in a lot of fear about my dad, my dad this time and his feelings about certain things. And every time we'd get to a topic uh, that would challenge my dad, Dan, I would get pretty rigid and there would be a projection come out of me towards AJ of trying to control the course of where the discussion was going rather than just feel my terror, feel my fear. And there's one talk where I think it's quite noticeable um, that I'm having a little bit of a meltdown and I'd really love it to never be seen again. But... <laughs> That's the one everyone watches. Oh, this is where Mary's getting rigid. Um, where we talked, I don't know if... Uh, it, we talked at the start of the talk about the unloving projections that the, a lot of the people in Greece were actually uh, projecting at us. And I have a large feeling inside of me that I'm not allowed to speak up when someone's being unloving towards me. That's actually unloving of me. And... It's not actually the truth because we talk about love um, all the time and if one of you was being unloving to the other of you, I would certainly speak up about it. But when it comes to someone else being unloving to me, uh, I still have a lot of fear about saying that. Mind you, I'm willing to project about it, which is, is actually a very unloving thing. So um, what happened at the end of Greece was that AJ and I had a talk. He talked to me about some of those things, um, but I was also becoming increasingly aware of them and uh, the, my desire to stay in a certain pattern uh, in the way that we teach, in the way that I live. <laughs> uh, and perhaps it was the first real pure desire that I had to confront my facade self. And I'm going to talk about the facade and the sleep state a lot uh, in, in, a little while, in a little minute. Um, but perhaps that was the first time I was really wanting to see a little bit of my facade and how much I wanted to appear in control and very loving and uh, very good, <laughs> uh, when really there was a lot of fear that I was living in and there was also a lot where I really wasn't practicing what we were talking about, you know. I was getting rigid. At times, I have um, been angry with people who are around us because I haven't wanted to feel my fear. And so I felt quite humbled after recognising that and recognising how that was impacting on what we were teaching, the message we were giving to the world. When we're up here, the camera is on us and our dynamics are playing out. <laughs> and um, my projections at AJ and my projections at other people, I felt really strongly were damaging the purity of what could be presented. And so I decided to step back from that, although you've witnessed me having problems stepping back from that, because <laughs> I always want to interject. Um, and so probably more recently, I, I've realised that I, this is my passion, I do want to do it, but I need to be willing to feel and experience my fear and also not hide behind AJ as um, my security blanket. So that's why perhaps in the coming months you'll be seeing me do a few presentations on my own, talking about divine truth. Uh, but today, really, I'm just here as your sister to talk about some of my experiences that I've been having. And... Um, to be honest, I don't really feel like I'm a good person to teach the divine truth at the moment because I feel I haven't been practising it for four years, really, uh, which is what I've been coming to terms with in the past few weeks. So really, I'm just here to share with you some of my experiences and um, 
I wasn't going to do that this weekend. It's not an accident that we're talking about the facade self and the sleep state this weekend because we were going to be talking about other things. But because of some of the things that have come up, uh, especially for me, and that's brought up things for AJ in the past few weeks, um, we decided this was a relevant thing to talk to you all about. And I wasn't actually going to share anything because um, I was recognising how far I've been away from practising truth. But yesterday, as I was doing the filming, uh, I was pretty heavily prompted by my spirit guides to actually share what I'm about to share with you. Um, and I'm a bit nervous, <laughs> but I hope, it is my sincere hope, that perhaps it will help uh, some of you have a desire to know what's happening in your sleep state. Uh, I know a lot of you are a bit freaked out by what AJ's been talking about uh, this morning. But I can honestly say that I, the last few weeks have been pretty full-on, very emotional, and at times I've really wanted to resist the truth that I initially asked for. Um, but I do feel a greater sense of um, empowerment in myself, in my own healing. I'm not trying to avoid myself as much. And uh, that's a really beautiful place to actually be. Uh, it requires confronting some fear to desire the truth about ourselves and what we're doing in our sleep and awake states. But if we can challenge that fear, um, it's my experience that life can change really rapidly. The truth is for myself and AJ, um, we have been in some pretty repetitive cycles for four years. Uh, him desiring to come closer to me and me uh, putting up all kinds of resistance and blocks towards that and being in a lot of anger. And until recently, I thought that I had worked through quite a bit of anger. And I realised that um, I had done that all on the natural love path in the last few weeks. That's what I've realised. Uh, I haven't actually dealt with the causal reasons for my avoid what I'm avoiding, basically, in my rage. And uh, I've just modified my behaviour. And so that's... That's something really important, I feel, to uh, feel about as we're talking about the facade, the damaged and the real selves. And I'll talk a bit about that now um, in a minute on the board. But uh, that if we're really addicted to our facade, and I'm very addicted to my facade, and the reason I'm very addicted to my facade is that I'm incredibly invested in how you feel about me. I want you to think I'm great all of the time, not just 99% of the time, all the time. And I also want to maintain an image of myself, inside of myself, that I think is good and right. And the truth is, uh, my facade doesn't match my damaged self as much as I want it to. There's a lot of damage in me that makes me be an unloving person. Um, but my facade is that I really want to be this loving person. Perhaps because I have such a strong sense of my real self, because I've been quite connected to that self for a few thousand years. Um, so I'm very rigid in my facade. And um, that's caused me to be very resistive to my damaged self. So I'm just going to talk a bit, just a bit of a recap. Uh, as AJ did earlier about the real self, I just want to have it here as a visual. So there's our real self in the centre. Here's the damage. And oops, outside of all that is the very hard eggshell that is my facade. And I, I always, Rachel really helped me with this analogy as, as I was going. Rachel is my guide. Um, uh, so I did a lot of channeling in the last few weeks and she really helped me with this analogy of the egg and the fact that... Um, that my facade is very rigid and hard, and for most of us it is. It's this thing that we don't want to let go of. It's the, the feeling that we must control this image of ourself to ourselves and to other people. And it is the hardest, I think as AJ said yesterday, it's the hardest part of ourself. Um, and that's, I think that's why we often feel like it's hard <laughs> breaking into these things is because we have such an investment in maintaining this eggshell part of ourselves. Okay. 
I'm just going to take a deep breath because I'm just a little bit nervous about what I'm going to share. And I... Okay. <laughs> so really, as I was relating, when we were in Greece, uh, I kind of came face to face with some of the damage that was under my facade. The fact that there's still a lot of fear in me and I don't want to experience that. I want to be in my facade and control my surroundings and present a certain image of myself to the world. Uh, when we came back from Greece, um, we came back and realised there was a lot of stuff uh, coming out of me in my facade wanting to control the course of our relationship. And so we decided to live separately for a couple of months, which I, we did. And during the course of that time, I also uh, opened up to a little bit more of what is really going on inside of me. But there's still been a great deal of resistance. Uh, we've been back together for a couple of months, yeah, uh, living together. Uh, and... Um, Really, the same pattern has ensued. Uh, AJ wants to be close to me. I put up a lot of blocks towards that, um, both in our emotional and our physical relationship. And I try, I've been trying to acknowledge that that's the truth, but I haven't wanted to emotionally understand that. So when we were actually, when we were down in Oktoberfest, um, the first morning that we were there, I went and did some yoga. I'd ask Cecily, would you, I'd love to learn yoga from you. Would you give us yoga in the mornings? And so the first session that I went to, I got out of bed. I did what many, you know, many times I lie in bed and I wake up and I feel terrible and I try to avoid myself. This morning I had to get up and go to yoga. So wham, I was immediately in my body. And she started just moving us into different postures. And um, one of the postures I, f I just found triggered utter terror in my body. I couldn't stop shaking and crying, and it was all sexual terror. And for the remainder of that day, I really opened up to a lot of feelings about uh, sexual abuse that I've been avoiding for a long time. They've been triggered in me for a long time, and I've been suppressing them. So this is all kind of the precursor to what happened. <laughs> In the following days, AJ and I talked a lot, AJ talked to me a lot about desiring your soul, really wanting to feel yourself and who you are. And because I'd had this, it was a day-long experience really of just being completely in my causal emotion, I'd realised how beautiful that was. It was quite challenging, but it was also very beautiful. I felt very much connected to myself. And so I began to pray to God uh, with the promptings that I'd had from in my discussion with AJ, just about feeling my soul, really desiring to feel my soul. And a few mornings later, actually, I think it was the last day of uh, Oktoberfest, I went down to yoga and the night before I had a really big cry as well, just feeling some of the sadness that I have inside of me about feeling that I'm a really yucky person that I rarely let myself feel those kind of feelings. I went to yoga and I was driving back up from yoga and I just really opened my heart to God and I said, please, can you bring me the biggest truth that will bring about the biggest healing for me at this time in my life? And I really felt it. And I walked in the door and, and AJ um, said something to me. And I think perhaps because I had had that huge open-hearted desire, for once I didn't avoid it. And I sat down and I went into it. And it was all about what's happening in my sleep state. And a lot of truth has been uncovered to me uh, in that process. Before I tell you actually what uh, it was, I want to give you a bit of a background on my personal emotional condition because this is where I feel a lot of you are really afraid about what's going on in my sleep state and um, the truth is it's very related to what's happening and what we're avoiding in our awake state and so if I can just give you a little bit of background on my personal emotions for all of my life really I promise I'll try to keep it short there's just four main groups of emotions that I want to talk to you about in context of what my facade would like to feel is the truth about me and what is really the, the truth about the damage within me. So none of these things are my real self, but unless I'm willing to break down the facade and heal the damage, I'm never going to get to my real self. So there's four main areas. Um, just 
move the facade. Uh, so one of the group of emotions is about sexuality. Another set is about shame. There's another set about soulmates or my soulmate relationship. And the fourth is about integrity. So, AJ's been talking to me about these emotions, the injuries that I have in these emotional groups for four years. And many times I've intellectually acknowledged what he's talking about. And I might have at times even touched a little bit of the emotion related to them. But the truth is my addiction to my facade has been so great that I have never wanted to actually fully embrace the truth of the damage that I have in these four sets of emotions. So with regards to integrity... Um, my facade self would like to believe that I'm a very honest person, that I'm very loyal, that i um, very transparent in my dealings with others, that I have a strong commitment to truth and love in my life. And in fact, in my life before I met AJ, I would have said though, all of those things with a lot of passion and conviction. You know, I was committed to serving people and it was a very heartfelt feeling inside of me. Um, and that I, I believe in honesty and I believe in loving everyone and it's really important. And then I'd probably get a little bit angry about that, which is not loving, <laughs> and say that everyone else needed to wake up. So uh, you can see even in my illustration, I, I had this idea of myself that I was a loving, honest, open, transparent, loyal person. But the truth in my damaged self is something different. The truth is... Every time we want to avoid a difficult or painful emotion, we can't be in integrity. The, the only way that we can be honest, uh, open, can be um, direct, uh, be... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, equal in our dealings with everyone is if I'm willing to feel the emotions that are triggered in all of my interactions with everyone. If I'm not willing to feel them, then my desire to avoid the emotion is going to override my desire to be loving, isn't it? I, I, if I want to avoid the emotion more than I want to um, be loving, then I'm... Am I saying that right? Yeah. If I want to avoid the emotion more than I want to be loving then I'm going to be out of integrity, aren't I? I can say I'm a loving person, and I can be loving in a lot of situations, but if in then one situation something gets triggered and I don't want to feel it, boom, I'm going to go to another place that's either angry, resistive, avoiding, running away, that isn't love because I don't want to feel that emotion. And the last few weeks has really taught me this about integrity. I can have a desire, what I feel is a desire, to be honest, to deal with myself, to deal with others in a loving manner, but if, unless I'm willing to feel the difficult emotions that are triggered within me, that is not the truth. It's just not. So we're always, there's always going to be a compromise in order to avoid the emotion. So the real truth of my damaged self is that I have not been acting in integrity in a lot of ways. As I've said to you guys, like some of you guys, I've projected anger at you. I've been angry with you, you know, because a fear has been triggered by something that happened or I haven't wanted to felt unloved, unloved by something that you've done. Now, in that space, I'm really not in integrity. I'm not in integrity to what I'm standing up here and supposedly teaching you and I'm not integrity in my own desire to be a loving person and to deal with all people with respect and love and um, that's been a really humbling thing to recognize about myself that my facade has wanted to hold on to for a good 30 years um, yeah so that's in the area of integrity in terms of my emotions around Soulmates and my soulmate and my, the soulmate part of me. My facade self um, would like to say to you <laughs> that I think soulmates is a beautiful gift from God. It's a wonderful thing. How wonderful that someone has created the perfect partner for you that you can have a, soul, a complete soul life with. Um, 
uh, my facade self would tell you that I value monogamy in a soulmate relationship, that I feel that um, it's the most important relationship you're going to have in your life by your relationship with God. That's what my facade self has been telling me, <laughs> to me, and to everyone else for about four years. Um, and the truth is something actually very different. The truth of my real emotional condition is that um, I feel really angry at God about the fact that soulmates exist. I feel like I don't have any personal choice. I feel like I can give my heart to someone and they can be gone. And I'm really angry about the loss that is already inside of me about having lost that relationship. And so whenever we come close, I want to rebel against that because I want to rebel against the loss and the grief that is triggered within me as we come closer together. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure I'm not skipping over anything. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, the third set of emotions re pertains to my shame. I have a huge amount of personal shame. Um, and actually, because of who I am and because of the projections at me for 2,000 years of being a whore, I actually carry a huge feeling inside of me that I am a dirty person sexually, that I'm immoral, um, yeah, that I'm, that I'm a very shameful creature is really the truth of how I feel about myself in my damaged self. My facade self is in complete rebellion against those feelings. I don't want to be shamed by anyone. And I certainly have, in my facade, felt that I've lived a life that is without shame. That uh, sexually, I have not been a dirty person. And in fact, in my awake state, I have been quite closed down um, towards sexual pleasure all of this life. The truth is I've actually, in my damage, done quite a few things that have been immoral sexually <laughs> and have increased my shame in this life. Um, but that's what occurs where we rebel against the damaged self and we don't want to feel it and we try to live in the facade. It ends up catching up with us and we end up acting out those things. The fourth set of emotions. Um, so this is all, I'm just giving you the context of what's been going on in my life. Um, and the fourth set of emotions pertain to sexuality. So in my facade self, I would tell you that sexuality is a beautiful gift from God, <laughs> that uh, it's something created only to be shared with your soulmate. Um, and I would probably tell you this very passionately. In fact, I have told other people this very passionately, that um, I feel that our sexuality is created not just for the gender that we're attracted to, but only for our soulmate. And that in the context of a loving soulmate relationship, sexuality is this beautiful, amazing thing. And the truth is I probably have some memories about that being the case. But my facade self wants to hang on to the fact that this is how I am now, that this is my soul condition now, that I believe this now and I know this now. And the truth is actually something really different. The truth is I'm, a f I'm, I'm really angry about my sexuality. I'm really in a rage with men about how I've been humiliated and degraded sexually. And I really, um, I really have a sense of powerlessness within me around my sexuality. I feel that it is a powerless place to be open sexually and to have other people connect with me sexually. I feel it's a place... I feel I have been made to feel powerless a lot sexually, especially in my first century life. And as a result, there is a rebellion against that also inside of me. And there is a huge desire in me for power and control sexually. I want power over men sexually. I want control of our sexual interactions. I don't even want to orgasm with a man unless I'm in control of it. Now, my facade self really doesn't like that truth about me. 
My facade self says, judges that really strongly. In fact, judges a lot of what I've just shared with you really strongly and says, that is way not loving, Mary. <laughs> that is yucky. That is a really yucky thing. And so what has been happening inside of me is almost like there has been a war going on between the truth of my damage at the moment and what my facade self wants to cling to as, as the truth about me. So every time that my damaged self hits up against the facade that I want to maintain, there's rage. There's a rage that comes out of me. And this has been a lot of what I've been living in for four years. Um, and it does pertain to my sleep state, which I'm... That's, that's where we're going to. This is all the, the background. In fact, when I first met AJ about four years ago, um, a lot of these things were, if you like, sent into overdrive within me. <laughs> because I'd been living quite comfortably, although on reflection perhaps it wasn't quite so comfortable, but I felt I was in control of my facade before I met AJ. And some of you probably have this same feeling. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then I met AJ. And of course, he challenged a lot of my facade. And I didn't like that. Hence, I was really angry. Um, but if I can rewind a little bit before then. I met AJ really briefly uh, on a couple of occasions and we hardly exchanged two or three words. And this is, I think you've heard the backstory of how we, we kind of came then. I found out that he felt that he was my soulmate and so then uh, me being me, I, although I don't know if that's... I, I wanted to know what it was all about. The truth is my soul was already engaged uh, in, in knowing that there was something going on here, but I was pretty rebellious towards it. But I knew I couldn't leave this guy alone. So I tracked him down, I hunted him down, and I said, what's going on here? And, and at this stage already, I'm feeling inexplicably drawn and attracted to this, to this man. I haven't even said two words to him, and I've met him on a couple of occasions. Um, so already, this, I guess this whole soul thing was being challenged and drawn. My real self uh, was drawing me, I suppose, towards him. Um, but it immediately started to uncover my damage and shake my facade, if you like. Uh, he hadn't really said anything much at all at this point. <laughs> and then we started to, to communicate and... Um, and he really didn't say that much about me then either. He, we talked about it, my life and his life and, and in the course of that, definitely issues of love and morality and different things were uncovered. Um, and I was pretty rebellious. Again. I think that's the right word, isn't it, babe? Rebellious against those, those thoughts at that time, yeah. When we eventually started a relationship, within a few days probably within a few weeks, a lot of these, these emotions in my damaged self started to appear, um, or the rage that I had between the facade and the damage started to appear. Almost, it actually freaked me out. Um, uh, one day we were engaging, um, we were kissing and stuff, and, and I wanted to make love, and I just said, look, I can't, I just feel like you're being a bit controlling <laughs> here. And... Um, I immediately went into a massive rage saying to him that you just think I'm a shameful, dirty slut, don't you? Uh, now, I had not ever connected with any of those emotions before in a conscious way. I've been living in the damage of them, uh, the fact that, that I was carrying that feeling inside of myself. But they came out of me in a huge tirade and I actually had to go and lock myself in the bathroom and freak out because I thought, where did all that come from? I, I don't, my facade was so well in place inside of me that I, was, I didn't think that anyone, like, least of all me, could think that I'm a dirty person. So, um, yeah, so a lot of this has been happening for a long time but I have really been in a state of wanting to maintain this facade and, and I guess I'm sharing that with you because I feel that many of us are in that position. <laughs> we really want to hold on to this idea of the person that we think that we are. Um, yeah. 
So if I go back then to my story, does anyone have any questions at this point? Uh, no? Joy, yep. Mary, um, when you were talking about the facade, yep. it seemed like it was um, very intellectual, is that? Yeah, well it has to be, doesn't it? Yeah. It's the thoughts that I have about the kind of person that really that mum and dad are going to love. Mm. <laughs> um, mm. And so I'm trying to, with my thoughts and my mind and my intellect, direct my emotional condition and my life mm. in a certain direction. Mm. But the truth is our soul is an emotional creation mm. and it's going to dominate that whole... And this is why I, I don't know... How, no, go ahead. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, I feel for Mary, her facade was very much what she actually believes in her real self but, but yeah. an attempt to avoid the damage. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, try, I sort of yeah. tried to allude to that before. But yeah. um, the truth is um, my real self has been really um, perfected in love for a long time. So um, I have a strong sense of what is loving. And um, so my facade is actually <laughs> quite... Like, my idea of what I sh want to be is actually quite loving. <laughs> it's just that I don't want to acknowledge or feel the damage that is inside of me. If I can explain it, it, it is almost like a feeling of humiliation when you're so tuned to what is loving and then you realise how far you are from that loving state. It feels abhorrent to myself if that makes sense. And so I feel that is why I've been perhaps so rigid in my facade. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. But I, I do have a lot, as AJ was talking earlier, a lot of reflection about this intellectual course that the facade self would take us on. And now we're going to be talking, reflecting about the sleep state and how it's, it's, it is harder for the intellect to... Well, perhaps it's harder for us to maintain a facade in the sleep state. Um, so often we end up acting out a lot of the emotions that we're avoiding in our, in our awake state. But I was reflecting on the natural love path versus the divine love path and how difficult it must be to progress on the natural love path uh, while on earth. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Really? I, yeah. Enjoy, yeah. Um, and I was wondering if that's why, um, you know, as AJ said earlier, that when we have those not normal conversations, we're in that intellectual place and that's why it never gets us into the, the damage and the actual emotions. You mean when we're just talking about the weather with each other? Yeah. Yeah. And then we also talk about our emotions a bit like that. Yeah. Like it's the intellectual view, so it's just yeah. the facade. Yeah, it is. Well, it's... Yeah, it is really in the facade because if you think about it, or if I feel about it, my facade is the, it's the presentation I give to the world. So sometimes I might be even saying different words. It's like if I got up here in a completely disconnected state and told you all about my sexual shame and all this stuff and my heart wasn't there, I'd still be in my facade. Like, I, I'm still buffering you, yeah. So it's my prayer to do it differently today, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Barbara. Yeah. Um, did I understand that right? That um, because you, because of you being reincarnated, you have a true sense of your real self. So your actual facade is your real self, but you're skipping over all your damaged self. Is that um, to a certain extent? Sort of. The, the truth is, though, there's errors in my facade because of growing up. It's, also, it's, it's related to the sense I have of my real self, uh, which is not complete by any means. Um, it's more like a memory um, because if I need to get through my damage to get to my real self. But it's also, my facade is also heavily influenced by my parents. Uh, so in this life, my earthly parents' perception of what is a loving person and what will get me love from them. And for m the majority of you, your facade is based around that. What, what I learnt from my parents about how I could get love from them and approval from them. Yeah. So is it, does that make sense? So it's, it's actually a combination. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But because you had such a real sense of yourself, you could probably draw on more of that to 
to build your facade because of the person uh, I, that... I suppose, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a strong sense of how I should be inside of me. It's, it's very rigid at times. And I, and I also feel this is why I'm so prone to self-punishment because I'm so rigid about what I should be like, what, what is loving, and I know it's the truth. And I, I want to punish myself about that, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mary. Nat? So just with the emotions that you've listed there, yep. your facade self keeps you from feeling the true damage about these particular emotions. Yep. Are these the same emotions that actually stop us from remembering what we're doing in our sleep state? Okay, so this is what I'm getting to. Okay. Yeah, yep. it is. It, uh, these four sets of emotions that I've um, outlined is specifically for the context of what I'm about to share to you okay. with you about what I've been doing in my okay. sleep state. Cool. However, it is. If you, if you remember, and I hope I did it clearly enough, I talked about the the four sets of emotions and what my facade self wants to believe is the truth and what is actually the truth. Yes. And they're quite separate. Yes. So when I go to sleep and I take actions in my damaged self, I wake up, my facade self is already just wanting to completely deny my damaged self. I want to, I want, no, this is the truth. My facade self is the truth. And so because there's that strong, uh, I'm not going to remember any of that because I don't want to. I want my facade self to be the truth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So this is why anything we're avoiding in our awake state and why AJ and I have linked the facade self with the sleep state experience so strongly because if, we, if we're addicted to facade, there's a high likelihood we're acting out in our damaged self in our sleep state and we're not going to want to know because we're, in, we're addicted to the facade. The more we can break down this facade using those qualities that AJ talked about yesterday, the more open we're going to be to remembering, yeah. Sorry, yeah, again, yeah. Sorry, so basically we're all addicted to our facade because none of us remember our sleep state. Pretty much. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's the truth. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Just at the back with Rochelle. Yeah, yeah, Pierre, sorry, with Rochelle there, yeah. Um, so is there a sphere you get to where you just cannot maintain the facade anymore? Because you've grown, like, in three years still, like, you've gotten to... A certain I don't know, sphere. Shell. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that the last couple of weeks has shown me a lot about where I haven't grown and where I've grown on the natural love path. Um, I feel there's changes in my soul, definitely, and there's more of a relationship with God than there was three years ago because I kind of was in a, a black hole with God for the 30 years before that. Um, but I feel really what I've learnt about myself is how much I'm still invested in the facade and how I've actually been damaging my soul and my soul mate in the sleep state and my soul can't improve, it's the one soul this is the thing, when we go to sleep it's still our same soul um, and the actions I take there are just as real as the ones I take in my awake state so um, I feel I've grown in that I on the morning driving back from yoga, I had a heartfelt prayer for truth from God. That was growth because <laughs> I didn't want it before that point. And um, as I'll talk about in a minute, AJ and I had even discussed certain things relating to this truth that I uncovered before then and I completely resisted it. I went intellectual. I said it was a dream. It's all, you know, and so my growth, I feel, is in that I desire truth. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go to the point where I um, walk in the door and AJ says, <laughs> so um, you know this background context now of the fact that I'm, I'm living in denial of a lot of shame. I want power and control over men so I can avoid my powerless feelings sexually. Um, I want to believe I've got all this integrity, but the truth is I want to avoid my dark emotions so I can't have any. And I'm also angry at God about not just the concept 
that I could have a soulmate that I might lose and that will make me grief-stricken, but also the sense of powerlessness that I have in our relationship. Not because he has power over me, but because I can't bloody control the attraction I have to this man. I, I, I've tried, you know. I, I've been in a rage with him and I still want him badly. And so... That makes me feel incredibly powerless. I can't define myself now, God. You've, and the truth of all of this is that I can't define myself. All of our efforts in our facade are attempts to define ourselves, to say, I want this life. I will be this person. I'm going to do this thing. And um, the truth that I came to in the course of these few weeks was actually really beautiful, and that is that really the hard work's being done for me. God has created a beautiful person, a really wonderful person with really unique qualities and characteristics, with a huge desire and passion, who's just going to be creative if she can just be herself. So in my facade, I'm working really hard all the time to be a good person, do what are my goals, what am I going to do, how am I going to get that done, no, no, no. And it's all this really hard work that I'm maintaining, all in an effort just to avoid my pain. When if I just let go and feel my pain, I'm just, I don't have to make myself anything. I just have to return to the self that God made me. And then I'm going to be really happy. <laughs> I don't have to figure out what's going to make me happy. I just have to engage my desires, be willing to feel my pain. And then I'm going to be at my real self. Um, yeah. I forgot where I was going with that, but <laughs> that was a beautiful thing to realise. So I'm, I'm praying my prayer for truth. I want to feel my soul, God. I, I really want truth. Bring me the biggest truth you can bring me. And I walked in the door and I, and I said, how are you going, babe? I'm still going through my stuff at yoga. It feels pretty full on. And he said, I'm feeling really upset because I feel like you've been with someone else in the sleep state. Now, my facade is pretty upset about that. That's not something that I would do. <laughs> Um, but perhaps because I was feeling a little more humble, I sat on the kitchen floor and uh, asked God for the truth about that and I asked my guides for the truth about that. And I got a big yes. And that was really hard. <laughs> it was hard to say that to AJ as well. And... Um, triggered all of my shame that I've been trying to avoid for that long. And at that point, we kind of went into lockdown. We didn't really leave the cottage <laughs> for about three days. And um, I just really asked God to help me heal what is going on. And so I channeled a lot in those few days. And um, I guess because I kept praying for truth, I kept having more and more realisations about what was really happening in my sleep state. And this is the powerful thing about desiring truth, hey? You real, I've realised how much I've been avoiding truth in, my, in this process. I want to give a talk in a, in a couple of months about... Um, what I call the real holy trinity, which is truth, love and humility. And I've been pretty hot on that for a little while. But I realised that the love and humility thing was really um, what I was focusing on. I didn't actually want the truth because I was addicted to my facade. I love God's truth. That's fine. I'll talk to you about that all day. But my damage, I've got so much shame and pain in my damaged self. I didn't want it. And so really opening my heart and asking God for truth. And I want to encourage you guys, if you want this process, if you want this connection with God, Ask God about truth, the truth about, and, and want it from your heart, you know, because in the course of those few days, a lot of truth became known to me. And um, it wasn't just that I'd cheated on AJ once in the sleep state. It was that for most of my life, since adolescence in this life, I have been involved in a lot of sexual sexually immoral and deviant things in the sleep state um, with a lot of different people, with a lot of different spirits and uh, with, with people in spirit form. And um, 
Yeah, and I want to talk a bit more about that. So I found that the truth was that um, because of my feelings of <sighs> powerlessness, and re rebellion at a sense of powerlessness that I've been involved in um, a lot of sexual practices that involve me having power over other people and feeling very powerful. <laughs> the second thing was in rebellion to my shame. that I have wanted to um, almost become shameless and to be as, to present, to, to rebel against my shame so much that nothing would shame me. And so I would be involved in all kinds of things that um, many people would find quite shameful and immoral. And the third thing was, the rebellion against the huge feelings of loss that are inside of me about losing my soulmate and my anger about love specifically about romantic love between soulmates um because of the level of pain that I have inside of me about the loss of that love, um, I feel really angry at God about love. And I also feel that love isn't possible. Uh, you know, when I met AJ, I used to make fun of romantic movies. I'd be like, oh, yeah, whatever, <laughs> in Hollywood. That was my feeling. It's not possible between people. It's not possible to be happy. There's always going to be pain. There's always going to be compromise. There's always going to be tough. And, and I was really angry to the point where I was sarcastic and bitter about the concept of romantic love. Now, I understand that a lot of that comes from the feelings of pain that I'm avoiding inside of myself. And many of you have this same feeling towards romantic love that... Um, your facade self wants to believe that it's a truth, but inside the damage is saying, no, F that. <laughs> that's not real. And I, I'm really hurting that that's not real. I'm really hurting that I feel like that's not possible for me anymore. So because of these emotions that I've been... So the anger about love, the rebellion against my shame and the rebellion against a sense of powerlessness, especially sexual powerlessness... I've been engaged in a lot of sexual practices that are either um, to do with me having power and feeling shameless and actually uh, more recently with people actually abusing me sexually because I feel so bad and a lot of self-judgment about myself. So I've been a willing participant in people actually harming me and hurting me sexually. So that's been happening for a good... 15 years and in the past four it's probably intensified because my sense of rebellion against these things has increased as my facade has been challenged so and also as I met AJ my anger about love and about the loss of him became directed at him and I wanted to punish him sexually because that is something that does really hurt him that I've been wanting to punish him um, through these practices. So it's actually gotten worse. And my shame has been more triggered and my sense of powerlessness, both in, in terms of fear, but also in terms of this inexplicable attraction and not being able to control the course of my life because of what my soul wants to do, not my head. Um, they've all increased. And so the rebellion and these uh, practices have, have really increased. Is there any questions? 
the Sheridan. It, just the hip here, yeah. Um, was AJ aware of what was going on in the sleep state for most of that? Um, okay, so... We had talked on a number of occasions. He had had that feeling before. And I've also had... I have pretty intense dreams as well. Um, some of which I now feel are sleep state experiences and some of them are dreams. Um, so often... Um, I would be, I, I would have sexualized dreams with other people, and we would talk about that in the morning. Um, and AJ has has long had the feeling that that I've been doing these sorts of things, but because I'm so addicted to my facade, I really wouldn't even consider that because it's abhorrent to me. Um, this, when I asked for God for the biggest truth, and I got this, and um, and I. I had to feel it as a truth. It wasn't just a concept outside of me. I really felt like this is my worst possible nightmare that I'm actually this kind of person because of the amount of judgment that I, that I have. And that's an issue in itself. Um, yeah. So, uh, yes, AJ was aware. And, and in fact, early in our relationship, I was still, even though I was drawn to this man, I'd been in a relationship with a man who... Um, who was basically sexually shameless. He'd been involved in a lot of um, uh, threesomes and with prostitutes and ha like had a lot of sex with a lot of people in quite immoral ways oftentimes. And even though my facade would say, I'm, I'm not attracted to that kind of man, I was very attracted to him and um, for a lot of reasons because he helped me avoid my shame. <laughs> um, he also... Uh, was prone really to violence, even if it was just emotional violence. And because of my sexual terror, even though my facade would say, I'm a pacifist, I want to be with a pacifist, I was really attracted to a guy who I thought would physically harm somebody else if I was sexually threatened. He had a strong sense of sexual ownership over me. And, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so... Even while I had engaged in the relationship with AJ, I was really still engaged in a relationship with this man. I was still attracted to him. We still had contact uh, via the internet. And I feel we had relationship in the sleep state as well now. So uh, AJ was, could feel all of that going on at the time. And AJ said he's happy to talk about some of his feelings about this as well afterwards, if, if you like, yeah. Thank you. No. Mary, just listening to you talk about the actions that you take because of these emotions of powerlessness and your desire to rebel, is it like then our way of controlling, avoiding the damaged self as well in the sleep totally, state? Totally, okay. totally. So the facade is here yeah. to control the yeah. damage. When like, we're awake. What, uh, the, uh, yeah, the emotion. Of, and, and remember I said at the beginning, whenever my facade is challenged and I feel a little bit of the damage, anger ensues because I want the control back. I want the control back. And when we go into the sleep state, the anger is still there. The anger is what we're acting out in. Unless we're willing to be humble to the damage in the awake state, it's very unlikely we're going to be humble to it in the sleep state. Okay. Yeah. And I just have one more question. I mean, with the third emotion that you've listed, loss, yep. obviously you have a first century life none of us have, but I can relate to anger about love. That's what I say. I feel many people here have that can feeling. Can you give me an example then of behaviour that we could potentially enact in and ensue in because of this anger about love. Like, I felt that you really explained your loss and your anger about love because yeah. of the loss. So, okay. So, I'm angry about loss and I'm angry about love. So, I want to prove that love isn't possible okay. in my sleep state. So, uh, in a relationship, I want to prove to you, no, you, love isn't possible. See? This is what's happening. This is what I can do. And many of you women have this feeling. Um, of, and thing. wanting the man to prove that he loves us while we really act out 
um, is a part of the anger. It's not a loving state we're in. We're not, we're not being open and humble and willing to give and share. We're like, no, you prove to me because I've been hurt before. And so in the sleep state, we can do all kinds of things, sexual or otherwise, to a, to a soulmate or a partner in that emotion. Okay. Is that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Barbara down here. Yeah. Oh, Mary, thanks for sharing. <laughs> it's big stuff. Um, w- one question. We cr- we, we're damaging our soul more in our sleep state. If we, when we become aware of that, can we only correct that damage to our soul back in our sleep state? Or we only just have to... Um, work on the emotion that's causing that damage in our wake state. Can we, and I, I understand that, but can we work on that damage in our sleep state as well? Yes, certainly. We, uh, we can, and I feel I am right now in my sleep state. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot has changed in the past few weeks in terms of what's happening in my sleep state. And, um, and we both feel that change. But the key was that I had to be willing to face the facade and the damage yes. in my awake state. Um, while I was resisting that in my awake state, I wasn't, nothing was changing in my sleep state. So, you, and you, like, the repentance is repentance anywhere mm-hmm. and so I have a lot of focus prayer on it. It's the one soul whether you're awake or asleep so um, I recognise that in myself there's a lot of repentance to go through in terms of um, the way that I've been out of integrity and immoral and really harming my soulmate and my own soul but also for 15 years I've been involved with other people who are in their addiction and I've been helping them in their addiction so um, that is all stuff I need to be aware of in the awake state so so in the awake state if we make a very conscious decision wholeheartedly um, and connect God with that um, and before we go to sleep have that connection and have that wholehearted desire like AJ said this morning, that we can study in our sleep state. So if we and if we went with that intention, yeah. so if we went to the intention in our sleep state with that wholehearted desire and longing and truth, that we could correct yes. and repent in our sleep state. Yes, that's possible. But don't think you can do that and avoid it in your awake Yes. State. No, no, I'm fully so aware of that. Yes. You've got to want the truth, yes. really want the truth in your awake state. Yes, yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's not really a truth about your soul anyway. Yeah. 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 Wow. Thank you. Just up the back there. I, AJ, yep. Um, babe, can you explain perhaps to people how you set up the awareness in your sleep state of becoming aware of all this in your awake state? Oh, uh, yep. Yes. Okay. Oh, gosh, guys, this is so yucky, hey? Anyway. <laughs> um, no, no, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, uh, what I became, I, I channeled my Rachel, my guide, and Tim, her soulmate, quite a lot in these few days. And, uh, and as I did that, I began to be aware of the fact that I already knew this, that I was doing this in the sleep state anyway. I knew this and this is why I felt so icky and why it was even impairing uh, our awake state relationship because I was actually having increasing senses of shame. It wasn't decreasing. And so uh, a lot of things really lined up for me when I did the channeling and really started to feel. I felt like, no... This is not, I'm not basing this on a channeling, I'm basing this on an awareness now that I have inside of myself. And, um, but in the course of doing the channeling, um, Rachel talked to me about the fact that, uh, so I'd been involved in this really, a uh, lot of stuff about being powerful um, sexually for a long time. And actually, guys, um, I don't know, you're very, probably very aware that I'm portrayed in a lot of modern literature as a, uh, high priestess of sexual healing. Um, Mary Magdalene is this person who was ordained in some kind of uh, order in the first century and 
healed people sexually and uh, initiated men through sex. And there's a lot of literature out there about that. And part of what... Uh, Part of what I'm recognising is that some of that uh, has been influenced by the actual sexual practices that I have been engaged in in the last 15 years. And I hate saying that because I really have still a lot of feelings about that. But anyway, about the, the largeness of that. The, I feel like it's a bit grandiose, but I actually feel that that is partly the truth anyway. So... So, uh, Rachel was talking to me about the fact that I've been involved in this for a long time and that that has actually influenced different movements on the planet. There's a lot of movements out there who believe you should have sex to connect to God and that it's a lot of stuff going on. Anyway, um, but recently, uh, after we came back from Greece and we, we lived separately for a couple of months, I really worked on this idea of a soulmate and I did do some grieving and I did do some repenting about stuff that I've done in the past in this life and I, I started to develop more more of a, a flicker of a pure desire for for my soulmate and she she related to me at, that at that time I really disengaged from this this powerful practices in the sleep state of engaging with people in terms of power but I was still involved because of the sense of shame and the judgment and feeling really horrible about myself I was still engaged with men uh, abusing me sexually and me being involved in desiring that in the sleep state but that recently <clears throat> I'd actually come to a place in my sleep state where I felt like I can't do this anymore it's enough I really want change and growth so similar to the prayer that I'd had to God that morning about I really want truth. In my sleep state, I'd reached this point where I went, no, I really want, um, I really want something different. And, and that I'd actually come to AJ in the sleep state and talk to him about the fact that I wanted this to change. And so that we had agreed that... This is this what you're referring to, yeah? That we had agreed that um, we would deal with this in the awake state. And, and so that is what we did. And in the, in the weeks that have ensued, there has been um, much more of an awareness of now of us being more together in the sleep state. At times, me not wanting him to be near me, but just around me <laughs> because I'm feeling so much shame and all kinds of different interrelations that we now feeling in the sleep state. Whereas before, we were very separated because I was wanting that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is why I think AJ appears in your dreams a lot more than I do, because I really... This has been very humbling for me to recognise where my soul is actually at in terms of progression. So, yeah. Diana? Everyone's a bit freaked out, yeah? <laughs> Mary, in your... Um like recollection of these experiences in the sleep state. Um, are those experiences just with your spirit body and you feel them also in your physical body? How does that...? No, it's more... I, do, I, can't, I feel the emotion in my physical body, yeah. But it's like remembering something that's happened. So I'm grieving the memory of that, yeah. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Um, I'm more asking about um, in your memories of those ex sexual experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have a physical sensation yeah, do you have of them a physical, happening? Yeah. No. 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 Okay. No. It's possible that I'm not tuning in. No. It's like a memory of something that's happened sexually. Do you, yeah. So I'm not experiencing that in my body at the time. If I was, then I would feel that I'm having an exchange with the spirit at that moment. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. 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 No, it's, I'm relating it to... to uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I'm saying that if I was having the physical sensations of it happening to me as I'm processing, yeah. I feel it's happening at that moment. It's, po I mean... 
as we connect to different memories in our child and things that have happened in our sleep state in our childhood, we might have a physical sensation in our body for sure. But if it really feels like an actual thing, an exchange that is happening right then, then I would be wondering if that's a spirit experience occurring at that moment. Do you understand? Does everyone understand the difference that I'm talking about there? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you die? Yeah. No. Not really. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I. I guess um, I'm trying to like, if I can say what yes. I'm, I'm feeling like. Yeah. If you I'm, just hold the mic. Okay. Yeah. I've been feeling like in the last um, oh, a couple of months that possibly I'm having these sexual experiences in the spirit state. Yeah. And that I've, you know, got a spirit particularly um, around me who um, is pretty engaged with me. Yeah. Yeah. In that. Yep. Um, and then I, sometimes I, in the mornings I might, might wake up mm -hmm. feeling sexual and so I'm wondering whether that's a remnant experience of what I've been engaged in. Yeah, I feel it's probably that you've been engaged with that spirit sexually and you're waking up from that experience still feeling that it, now your spirit body's come into your physical body and you're feeling it in your physical body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, just D at the back, and then over to Luli on this side, Pierre. Yeah. Mary, just recently I watched the Love and Sex DVDs again, um, and I remember you and AJ sharing then about um, most of us women having sexual shame. And yep. you processing through some of that sexual shame. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is, because that was a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah. What have you been processing through? If <laughs> Well, the truth is I have processed some um, sexual shame back then. <laughs> but because I'm still in rebellion about a lot of the, the core feelings, uh, I'm creating more shame, Dan, in my sleep state. So I can't actually be getting through it. But the truth is also that because of my investment in my facade, I haven't been processing that much sexual shame. I've touched it here and there, and I have processed some of it, but because of my unwillingness to really open up to who I am, to what I've done, and the damage that's inside of me, I've been still acting in rebellion against it in my sleep state and therefore increasing the level of shame that I have. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and I guess there's different levels too, is there, that you can actually open up into and feel the depth of? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, and that's, I, like, I do feel that we need to be careful when we say, yeah, I was processing whatever. <laughs> um, sometimes we're just touching a feeling. Sometimes we're touching the, what the facade self will let us touch the the comfortable part of that emotion so for me uh, sexual shame um, I've allowed myself to feel ashamed of my body of my vagina I, you know a few of those kinds of feelings I haven't let myself connect to until very recently and as I still have a lot of work to do on what I have done with other people that is that I feel ashamed about um, and the feelings of shame I've felt as a result of abuse also. So I've felt it about my body, but I haven't been willing to open up into why I feel it about my body, if you like, what's underneath there, which is what I've done and what people have done to me, and really go into those experiences. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of my anger is because of this shame and pain and powerlessness. And the feeling you have when that... Yeah, the unwillingness to just feel those feelings, want to cling to the facade and go, I'm angry that I can't, I can't be the way I want my facade to be. I can't feel the feelings my facade self wants to feel. And my anger at men as well? Is that, or is that actually in some of the damage, my anger at these things having happened to me? Yeah, I feel that they're in the damaged self. There is definitely going to be some anger at men but ultimately the anger is still the layer above the sense of powerlessness the sense of hurt also you need to be careful about anger with men because sometimes it's the sense of entitlement you have with men that creates the rage they should be doing this and they're not and that's all about addiction 
Yeah, so it's hard to label. This is where you have to, I feel, and I'm saying you, I, I have to um, also be really aware of the truth. Like we have to want the truth of what's really happening emotionally for us, you know. Um, otherwise, our facade self is going to be tempted to say, I'm angry because of these three things that I'm comfortable about and it's not anything to do with those five things that I might judge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Babe, would you like to add anything about the shame that I was... No, okay, yeah. Uh, Luli, yeah. Um, hi. Um, I'm not sure if I can put this into words. I'm a bit confused about morality because, like, on this path, as you learn stuff, like, intellectually and in your soul, you learn what's moral and what's not. And so, like, while we're awake, like, there's no way we would do something because I feel at least in some areas, you know, I've learned that that's not loving yeah. inside of me. Yeah. But is that just in some areas or is that a facade? Do you know what I mean? Like, is it that you have to break down, like, all your facade to stop wanting to act out your damaged self in the spirit world? Or is it, like, you've, you learn certain levels of morality and then you're less likely to engage in those kinds of things? Uh, yeah, do you know, so do you know what I, mean? I, I think so. I'll, I'll I'll attempt to answer. Do you want to answer, babe? But, okay, you go for it. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, the the reality is for the majority of us that when we say we've learned morality, we have yet to learn anything about morality because we've only intellectualized morality. And we've yet to remove the emotion in us that actually allows us to have that morality enter our heart. And it's not until the morality enters your heart that you will actually have any integrity to the morality that you say you have in your awake state. Yeah. Mm. yeah I agree. That's mm. what I was going to say. Mm. And also that... Um, like my example about integrity, I felt that I had a lot of sexual integrity. But the truth is, my damaged self was presenting it. I wasn't sleeping with other people in the awake state. But I've certainly sexually projected at people in the awake state. So that's showing me that I haven't made a moral shift yet, you know. Um, so I feel that when you make the moral shift around sexuality, emotionally, you're not ever going to sexually project at anyone except your soulmate. So... Um when you break down the facade self is when you'll stop acting out these things in your sleep state? Um, you can break down the... Yeah, uh, there's two probably an parts of that answer. You can break down the facade in certain areas. You'd be willing to see certain things about yourself and then you're not going to act out in the facade, or, uh, in your facade or in avoidance of your damaged self. In, because remember, what I'm talking about here is the avoidance of my damaged self. If I was embracing my damaged self, I'd be doing none of these things in the sleep state. It's not my damage that's causing me to do these things. It's not the fact that I feel powerless sexually or that I carry a lot of sexual shame. It's my rebellion against those things that's causing me to act out. So be careful about labelling it your damaged self. It is, it is an acting out or an act, a rebellion against the damaged self that's causing me to act in those ways. Um, and certainly I can break down the facade and be willing to feel and see a whole area of my damaged self in the awake state. And so in the sleep state I'll, I'll have the same feelings. Um, there's a second part to that answer that may... Do, do you, sorry, I should have gone to you first. No. Um, what was the second part of your question? There's it, two parts. It was, do you need to break down the whole of the whole facade thing. to stop Bef acting out the rebellion? Yeah, well, yeah. You have to be willing to not be in rebellion <laughs> on that area to stop acting out in it, in the awake state as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that it's about those qualities that we listed yesterday, the quality of integrity, exactly. desire for truth. So you can still have a lot of your facade in place, but... But yes. if you have a desire for truth, a desire for integrity, a longing to know, a long, you know, trusting God, trusting what God's created, you know, having faith, those, all of those qualities, then that causes you to not go into rebellion. Because you, you have so much integrity, you're not going to choose in rebellion. Right. You're going to choose to feel the damage instead. 
It's only when you don't have that integrity and the desire for truth and desire for growth and all those things that you want to avoid the damage and that causes you to rebel. And then, of course, once you rebel, you're going to act out all of your damage in the rebellion. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is what's been very humbling for me to recognise how far... I, my facade thinks I've got all of these things when in reality I've had to face that um, <laughs> I haven't had much desire for truth or integrity and not really any faith or trust in God that if I deal with these emotions they'll be gone um, and perhaps I'm really, <laughs> I don't know it's pretty bleak yeah <laughs> just behind Luli there yeah Hi Mary um I'm finding this really difficult, so I keep coming and going. And yeah, um, but I'm just getting confused around. Um, so, does independence is there? Is that just another form of rebellion, or in in that state, is there anger? And you know how you can describe someone as being strongly independent, and yeah, and. In doing that, is there actually a lot of anger and... Pretty much. A, a, ..like shutting down or...? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, if we weren't in rebellion against anything and we were in connection with our real selves, um, we'd be in connection with God as well. Mm. And in that state, we don't want to be independent of God, really. We, we want to be... Um, there's not a desire in us to portray ourselves as an independent person. We know ourselves. We act in our own desires. But we also have this huge respect for God and the fact that we're part of God's creation. Uh, and so, I don't know. I, I don't know if you want to add to that, babe, but I feel there is a lot of anger in the desire for independence. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, not only that, a lot of anger towards the whole concept of soulmates in that yeah. whole concept. Abs absolutely. Because it, this is the... Uh, the issue that I'm trying to relate about the soulmate relationship mm. is that um, there is a sense of, I'm not me anymore. Mm. This is me it's it's and we're so this self-reliant i've really like been facing this self-reliance injury that is so in, so in all of us this desire for self-definition and i will create who i am and what i do and all of those things and really all of that is about independence it's also about rebellion against god and the way god created our souls to operate god didn't create us to be um what is the word under anyone else but he certainly didn't create us to be alone and in control all of the time he created this beautiful connection yeah so that's possibly like a block that we we have it's an anger like, yeah okay. yeah okay. all right thank you so much does, does that help yeah yeah okay. yeah a bit. josh just across yeah. hey mary hi josh um, I just want uh, the, with the qualities that were written up on the board yesterday. These ones, yeah. yeah I just wanted to ask a question about the, the development of those qualities. Um, generally, it, it's a gradual process developing those qualities. Yeah. Um, but is there a truth in that um, you can, through sheer will and a certain type of prayer, um, solidify those qualities very quickly into your being to deal with these big issues. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I I feel so. I hope that I'm in that process right now. Yeah, um, to, to an add to that. Yeah, uh, I, I feel that um, it's really possible to do that very quickly, like. Um, even just opening myself to a, a one true desire for truth has um, opened me up to a whole heap of other things that have the potential to uh, make me committed to integrity, uh, have faith in God, trust in God's process, really desire more and more growth. Like, um, And that's kind of the beautiful thing that I was trying to relate earlier about how 
life-changing it can be to desire truth <laughs> because all, if you're willing to just confront that fear about the truth and really want it in your life, I feel that things can progress really rapidly. I Do you want to add? To, I hope so because I feel <laughs> like... I'd like that to happen. I feel that already things are changing a lot more rapidly for me. Can I join you for a bit? Please do. Yeah, um, I love that. Yeah, I feel, Josh, uh, that Mary's probably made the most progress that she's ever made since I've known her in the last two and a half weeks. And, um, and um, it's been because of her having this really strong desire particularly the strong desire for truth, probably that's been the thing. Because we, we had to talk about integrity after that. And she's been building her faith and trust in God as well. Like before, when it came to any emotion, it was almost like if the emotion got too big for her, she would then just give up on the emotion. So just walk away from the emotion. And not, not having any faith that actually you can get through it and it can be released from you. So I feel that Mary you know, had been growing some faith and trust in God over that period of time. She's been growing in her desire for truth over the period of time. Um, over the last four years, she, uh, there's been a lot of anger coming from her towards myself. Um, and we'd discuss the anger and, we, and its cause, but, but then Mary would slip into this, uh, the natural love way of dealing with the anger, was I'm not allowed to be angry now. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I've got to deal with this some other way, right? And so she would be, uh, after a while, we, we would be able to have a discussion about the emotion still without Mary getting angry, but the problem is nothing would change still in our life really. And so that would indicate that the underlying soul changes were not being made. So that's modifying the behaviour because I feel exactly. That too. That's exactly. the natural love path. And yeah. yeah. And to be frank, I, I did the same thing at the beginning of my own progression. Uh, I, I tried to modify my behaviour for the first few years of uh, my own progression rather than actually dealing with the underlying soul reasons why I had the same, why I had that behaviour. And, um, and then I had to come to terms with exactly what Mary's having to come to terms with now, that I wasn't actually on the divine love path really yet. And I went through this whole tra change, which caused me to be very focused then on, unless I feel the emotion of this, I'm not going to heal it, no matter how much I try to be different. And the whole process of trying to be different causes its own problems. Um, it causes you to actually exhaust yourself with your emotions to a degree because you're trying to be different while at the same time you've got... So you've basically got this emotion pulling you in this direction and at the same time you're trying to move in this direction and the further that gap gets, the harder it becomes. So you're actually now going to feel a greater state of exhaustion. Does that make sense? And I feel that's one of God's uh, ways of showing us that actually we're heading in the wrong direction. Yep. Right? What we need to do is embrace... We, we need to stop trying to change things from the effect perspective and look at the causal reason why, you know, that we need to change. And while we're living in this facade or we're living in rebellion of the damage, we are not changing the causal emotional reason why a certain action takes place. And uh, it takes a bit to make those transitions. And what I've noticed is, it, see, my life now is very different to the first century. I didn't notice a lot uh, in the first century when it came to what was necessary to come from a condition of sin into it one moment with God. Um, I didn't really, I didn't have that experience in the first century, so... I didn't really understand how people could shift from sin into it one with God and, and what they needed to embrace in this process. Whereas now, in this experience, I've had a lot of experience now in what is necessary for you to become at one with God from a condition of sin. And what, one of the primary things that is necessary is an embrace, an, a process of embracing your damage, actually fully embracing it as, an, as emotions rather than intellectualising it um, rather than even talking about it you'll notice that generally I don't talk very much about my emotions except from a teaching perspective and the reason why is because I, I just feel it's 
really pointless embracing it or talking about it. In fact, I've said to Mary quite frequently that every time I'm asked to talk to somebody about my emotion, it actually feels like I'm actually degrading the experience. That's what it feels like to me now. So, so I'm much happier to have my own experience without having to talk about it because I can feel the experience more fully as a result. And I feel that's a part of that process of learning to embrace this damage. It's not your real self, but without embracing it, it will not flow from you. Without loving it, it will not flow from you. And as I said to Mary during this process that she's been through, you need to come to love what's inside of you no matter what it is. And part of loving what's inside of you no matter what it is, is being aware and willing to feel what's inside of you no matter what it is. So if it's rage, being willing to feel that rage. You know, if it's this terrible feeling about love, you know, that love's pointless and all those kind of, just to feel that feeling. We need to feel these feelings, to feel these damages, to work our way through them. We're still, many of us are still thinking we can talk about them and intellectually embrace them without actually feeling the damage of it like inside of our heart. And it's only the feeling that is going to cause us to progress. Does that make sense, Josh? Like... Yeah, I, I guess my question was just because I know like, you know, everyone's attracted here because they have a desire for truth. Exactly. But it's about strengthening that desire to the point of, you know, we've all at times had that and made some sort of progress and then yep. My question was how to get to that and solidify that and just keep going. <laughs> You're dead right, and you can do that with the facade, but you need a lot of prayer to do that and self-reflection. Um, I feel... Uh, and self-reflection isn't a discussion with somebody else. <laughs> self-reflection is a feeling that you need to work your way through yourself, by yourself, generally with God, in terms of coming to terms with, do I really have a desire for truth? Do I really have integrity? Do I really have these things? And if, do I want them for a start? And if you do want them, generate within yourself a desire and passion to have them and to, to learn about them and actually live them. And uh, that is certainly an essential part of anybody's foundation, I feel, of their, of their progression. And to me, that, you know, in the, in the Bible, I refer to... There's a, there's a lot of stuff that was paraphrased in the Bible in terms of, in terms of things I refer to. But I, I refer to a foundation built on solid ground. The foundation built on stone as a, compared to a foundation built on sand. And what I was illustrating was the difference between the natural love and the divine love paths. See, on, on the natural love path, we have a foundation built on sand because it's all intellectual effort, control, and, and an attempt to ignore what's really within us. So our foundation is built on sand. When a wind comes along, any stress, any external stress comes along, bang, we're gone. We're back to where we were before. And many of you experience, have experienced that through your life on other paths, right? On the divine love path, you've got to build the foundation on stone. And part of the foundation of stone is this. These are all the qualities that are a part of this foundation of stone that we've got to build on. Once we build on this foundation that's hard as a rock, now a wind will come along, some kind of external stress will come along, and we won't shift. And it won't matter how extreme the stress either. We will not shift. And it's not because we're stubborn. It's because these things, these qualities are now within us. And, and we can't get them out of us anymore. We, we can't even not live by them anymore. It's automatic. And that's where we need to get. Yeah. I feel that a lot of us have lost the feeling of beauty that comes from having integrity and having these wonderful qualities. Like I can just relate to my own experience. My facade self. My facade self really wanted to say I've got a lot of integrity because I see that as a very good and loving quality. But when I was faced with a situation where I needed to feel rather than react uh, or punish, uh, I f the feeling in me was the damage is too hurtful and too painful. It's it's hard to have integrity. And it was almost a, like a feeling of disdain towards integrity. Um, what I feel at the moment is that... Um, 
There's so much beauty in integrity that you will feel when you step into it, that, you do, that I feel, and I have just briefly stepped into it, that we've lost, we've lost the memory of that feeling. You know, I think we've felt that once. Um, and it's because of the fear of the damage within us, we feel like it's not a good thing anymore. I, like a lot of you feel like saying the truth and being in truth is a hardship. And really the... The truth is that it's not, it's beautiful, but we've lost the feeling of that, I feel like. We feel like it's, it's a duty rather than... When you actually do it, it feels like a gift uh, to yourself and to other people, yeah. Mm. Ned? Thanks for that. Mary, I just want to say thank you. It really feels like a gift for you to share your experience with us. And um, I also wanted to ask AJ, was it a physical feeling? When, you, when Mary said that you had approached her and said, I feel like you've been with someone else, could you describe that feeling to me? Well, I've had that feeling all through the four years of our relationship, um, actually, and I've discussed it with Mary on quite a lot of occasions. Um, but Mary felt quite differently that, uh, that she hadn't been having a relationship either in the sleep state. She did recognise that she's been having dreams involving other people sexually, but uh, she just felt that was about emotions that she was uh, having to deal with in the awake state that she wasn't dealing with. We also, during that time, discussed a lot about the different emotions that I felt Mary was not, not allowing herself to feel. And we would often discuss things like um, uh, Mary's willingness to actually address an issue. So, so what would often happen is that an issue would come up, uh, we'd discuss the issue, but there was no emotional connection in Mary with the issue. And that would concern me greatly because while there's no emotion, there's no healing. So, so Mary would feel that she'd dealt with the issue and I'm feeling like, no, I don't feel you have dealt with this issue. So, for example, when we first met, uh, within a few days, Mary was in this really extreme rage with me uh, about stuff I'd, uh, that she felt I did in the first century. You know, the first set of rages about were, were all to do with my death in loss. the first century. It's, the, it's, it's all about the anger, and love and loss. And, uh, and she was just in extreme rage with me, yelling at me and saying all these things that I left her and I chose to leave her and I didn't value her. And, and she didn't even realise at the time why all this stuff was coming out of her mouth. But she was Which just, is another reason why I shut it all down, probably. Yeah, she was frightened. insane. Yeah. yeah. Can you then... Um, if, if Mary, if you're angry with AJ but you're not saying anything, is it a feeling that you know she's angry with you? It's worse for me if Mary is angry without saying anything than it is if she's angry and she actually says it. The other day I just said to her, look, darling, you're really angry with me. You need to say what you're angry with me about. And, and, and then when she started allowing herself to connect to it, it was all, um, it was all just stuff like, um, you were saying how I shame you all the time and because... That's yeah, probably something I, had, I forgot to talk about is the feeling I have about the discrepancy in our condition that I've always had since we met, uh, especially in the sleep state because it's so noticeable. And so I've had all this rage, a feeling that I'm just humiliated just by the state of AJ comparatively to mine. Yeah, and so Mary has felt humiliated yeah. just being next to me in the sleep state so and so, sometimes in the awake state and sometimes in the awake state too you know but uh, but in the sleep state in particular the, the difference in condition is very noticeable and mary has been in a rage about it because she views my different condition as a humiliation of herself does that make sense yeah and, and because of the anger, then wants to pull me down to that condition. So, so she'd been taking actions in her sleep state in particular, but also in the awake state too, to attempt to pull me down as much as she possibly could. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons why I raised those issues with her is because I've been feeling uh, a group of spirits with her who are just doing her bidding towards myself, 
And so the, the group of spirits had been attacking me and, and I still feel quite sad about the fact that Mary had been sort of leading a, a group of spirits um, in this process of wanting to attack me just to pull my, myself down and pull my condition down. And I'm open to the attack because of my desire. Well, there's a couple of things. It's, uh, uh, there's a desire for my relationship with Mary, but, but also there's this openness to being attacked by women, uh, in particular, attacked from my soulmate. There's a, well, I'm not open to be attacked by women much anymore, but I'm very, still very open to being attacked by my soulmate. Um, and, and I've got to heal that, because uh, I need to get to the point where I'm not open to that attack anymore either. Can I ask one more question? Mm. Then from a soulmate relationship perspective, Mary, if you're uh, not, if you stop just feeling angry with AJ and then you start saying what you're feeling angry about, is that an opportunity for you to both grow in love? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's been really, really good, actually. Um, the problem has been with my facade. I'm not, I'm not, I can't feel that, I can't say that, I can't, you know. And, and the problem but, I've had with Mary through the four years is her facade too. Like, I'm, I'm saying to her constantly, to me, darling. You're not really that attractive. I like your real self. You know, <laughs> I like the real damage, the damaged <laughs> self even better than the facade that she created. <laughs> I said to Mary at one point, like, this Mary Luck person that you, you try to portray to everybody, you know, she, she's not very nice actually, and she's particularly not very nice to myself. And, uh, and I'd prefer the damaged girl, you know who might have to cry a bit and feels ashamed and so forth. And to me, she, she has a, yeah, she's a lot softer a person, obviously, um, than, and this is the trouble, is that the eggshell is a, is a heart, is hard. And when you, when you engage the eggshell in a person, you feel the hardness of it. And I'm pretty sensitive to that now with everybody. So, um, but in particular, sensitive to it with, with Mary. So I've had to work through quite a lot of grief through this whole process. Of course, I've had four years of feeling um, these things happening. So I've had a lot of grief in that four years' time. We've had quite a number of separations during that time. And I could feel during that time Mary's rage. And I'd frequently say to Mary, look, darling, you're just in a real anger with me and you just need to start telling me what you're angry about with me. See, so the issue has been me trying in the facade to fix it uh, and also tr only dealing with things that I feel comfortable with. And the truth is I feel like uh, someone asked if I'd grown. I feel like I've grown some in some small ways in some other areas in the last four years. Possibly more in some areas than a little bit, but... In terms of our relationship, there is so much pain there and so much resistance to that pain and so much of my facade that doesn't want to accept the pain because it's scary or irrational or I judge it as really unloving that it's just kept us so stuck and blocked um, to me even owning what I'm really angry about. Like the whole anger at love, the feeling of powerlessness, that was somewhere I didn't want to go. Yeah. There is one area I feel Mary has made huge advances in in the last four years. When I met her, she was so heavily invested in other people's opinion of her that it was impossible for her to even have an opinion of herself. So she was not invested in my opinion of her, ironically, because of all the rage that she had towards me, but she was invested in everybody else's opinion of her. And many of her emotions got triggered over that period of time of how much investment there was in everyone thinking that she's good and, uh, and all of those kind of things and, and everyone not seeing her true self and so forth. And I feel, I feel by a few weeks ago, Mary had pretty much released a, most of that to the point where she's able to get up in front of you now and speak honestly about what's been happening in the sleep state, about things that Mary feels quite ashamed of herself. So, and that, that indicates that this investment in her, other people's opinion, which is actually the basic cause of our facade, um, is, is, is almost gone. And now that's the case, like I feel a lot of hope for, um, you know, for Mary and her progression. Whether that means we're together in the future because of different things that come up, I don't know. But I do feel that um, there is a higher likelihood now of her actually making great strides uh, forward 
on the divine love path rather than making slow steps and slow increments forward on the natural love path as she had been doing, yeah, which we've discussed many times. Yeah. Thank you both very much for sharing that. Yeah. Is it Peter? Peter, yeah. I handed the reins to you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Is, is it possible uh, through prayer to, to set your intention uh, before you go to sleep at night so that during your uh, sleep state experiences you, you act lovingly? Or is, is that... Um, is, it, is what's going to happen in your sleep state an inevitable consequence of your soul damage and therefore there's nothing much you can do about it. Yeah, be careful, Pete, yeah. because what Mary has said quite clearly to you is that it's not an inevitable consequence of the damage, it's an inevitable consequence of the denial of the damage. That's really There's important. There's a big difference between that. But is, is, the, is the acceptance of the damage uh, a gradual process or, or do, no. you, do you just say, OK, I'm, I accept in this moment that I'm just totally damaged. It, it, no, when we say an acceptance of the damage, it's an, a willingness to emotionally experience the damage. the damage and not rebel against it. So you're not going to be so able to... it's not to, an intellectual choice. Yeah. It's a soul-based choice. Yeah. But isn't that like a, a, a massive process? Well, it is. It yes. is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One that everyone needs to make. Right. Yeah. So, so given that there's a massive process involved, the question is, can you set your intention every in, night before you go to sleep certainly you not can. to hurt people? And can I tell you what happened in my experience? Mm. Um, so one day all this was uncovered. Naturally, I didn't want to go to sleep. <laughs> um, and I really prayed about... Uh, I knew I hadn't dealt with all of the emotions. In fact, I was just in a lot of shock the first day. And, um, and I didn't want to believe it. Like, I, I knew it was true and then I'd want to go into complete denial and I'd have to come back. By my own bidding, AJ w wasn't really talking to me. I, I was, no, I know this is true, so I have to sit with it. So in the first and day, like, I still was out on the land with guys, with the guys, you know, doing things and so forth. So Mary had a lot of that day alone. So she had the chance to, yep. to feel about it. To feel about that. it. Yeah. But when it came to come, going to sleep, I felt really frightened that the same things are just going to keep happening and I don't want to damage my soul or my soulmate anymore. And so I really prayed uh, to, to just be isolated in the sleep state. Just if my celestial friends could come and just be around me so I could just stay with these feelings. And... Um, I prayed that for four or five nights. Um, all the while, though, Rachel, my God, was saying to me, we can do this, it's no problem, for a while, but you have to deal with these emotions because God is not going to afford you this protection forever because, unless you're willing to engage this process. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what has happened for me, and now I feel I'm more engaged in releasing the emotions of it and our interaction and my actions have changed a lot in the sleep state. We've and also made some feel... deals together, haven't we, yeah. in our awake state in terms of what mm. we'd like to see happen. And it doesn't necessarily mean it will, based on different emotions. But, but just that we will actively go to each other in the sleep state now, rather than... Because Mary's been avoiding contact with me in the sleep state. There's been literally hundreds of times where I've woken up in the morning and said to Mary, yeah... We, we, we didn't see each other the whole yeah. time yeah. in our sleep state. And I, so, I, so I've been feeling that for a long time, that there was a big avoidance of our relationship in the sleep state as well. And in fact, I'd said to Mary frequently that, darling, you need to decide whether you want to leave me or not because the desire in your sleep state is to not be with me at all, which would tend to indicate that your desire in your awake state is also to not be with me at all. And so you need to really decide whether you want to be with me or not. Um, yeah. yeah. And ironically, because I was so addicted to my facade, which is in this case related to my real self, which is, no, I want my soulmate and this is a beautiful gift from God, I couldn't even acknowledge how much I didn't want to be there. Uh, and that's why I, I'm stressing the relationship between the facade and the investment in the facade and the sleep state and how mm. interrelated it is. But, but Peter, I feel there's a difference between being in rebellion against your emotional condition and being willing to 
even if you haven't processed through all of it, be in the process of being open to and uh, open to it and acknowledging it. Then I feel that your sleep state experience will reflect that more. It, if you're in rebellion, your sleep state experience is going to reflect the rebellion. Mm. And that's where you can really do damage to your, your soul and other people's souls. Yeah. yeah. So, so just discovering the truth about what's happening is, is the first step, and that's what's been happening today. Yeah. And then the second step is to generate your desire to, to make a change. Exactly. And, and there's, a, there's a, uh, a time where you can ask for temporary... Um, assistance, assistance to to um, transition, and and you set you, you set your desire to to, to really want to uh, discover what your true emotional damage is. Yep, and and not live in the rebellion of it in particular or denial. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and will your law of attraction actually show you what your true condition is every day and your true desire in your awake state your law of attraction will actually ramp up that's something mary hasn't mentioned yet was what actually was happening around this area in her in her awake state life causing the triggers as well to demonstrate the truth of what was going on so there's a whole series of events that mary has yet to describe to you that are that are all about triggering these different emotions that she had been in denial of for quite some time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so for all of us, we could, we could um, feel hopeful that there is a, a, a way forward from today. Definitely. Um, I hope so. That's the whole point of the that's discussion. That's the point of me talking about it, actually, <laughs> yeah. is to say that this has changed things very rapidly and very beautifully. It's been very painful for both of us, but yeah, it's, it's so worth it. The so in the last like three nights in the sleep state at least, Mary, even though she feels this immense amount of shame every time I'm with her in the sleep state, she has spent those three nights with me in the sleep state feeling a lot of stuff in the process. Um, but, but we can feel, you know, we, we remember being together that entire the entire time. Instead of usually, I'd just pop in the visit for five minutes, get a burst of rage, and then Mary would be off, ha- you know, having some sexual interaction with somebody to make me feel worse, and then I'd have to leave and and go away and just feel about that. And so what what was that? What was happening was that I often wouldn't come to visit her in a sleep state at all because my very presence caused her to engage in more. Uh, sexual things to actually because of her desire to harm me and and part of it was my addiction to see her in a way was enabling the behavior Um, so in the sleep state um, you know I wanted to see her even though I could feel that she was probably going to try to harm me again and so so I'd go to see her but now that I see her um, she now has a way of harming me that's a part of the addiction, part of the addiction to avoid the pain. And so she every time took that action while I was present just to harm me further. And, and I realised, um, one of the realisations I've had to work my way through is how, how my desire and also my unhealed stuff about my soulmate is, was causing me to engage Mary when it was inappropriate to engage her and that actually increased her rage mm-hmm. and caused her to want to harm me further and in a way I was feeding the addiction like she would see the pain in me that was created by her harm of me and that would cause her to want to do it more mm. because she wanted to harm me in that manner and um, because of the avoidance of the pain that she has about love and the loss of our love and all those kind of things and feeling that it was all my fault. Um, it was all because of some choices I made. And, uh, and so I've had to work through a lot of my pain that I've had to work through uh, over the last few weeks has been, and in fact my rib broke as a result of me holding on to some of the pain um, that I have. Um, so I've got a broken rib that I broke down at Kyabra. Um which was a result of how I feel about myself when I'm with my soulmate and, and avoiding a lot of that emotion. But a lot of that emotion has been coming up for me now. And so, so that's good too. You know, it's like helping me heal my lack of self-awareness when I'm with my soulmate, basically. 
Yeah. So is, is the fastest way to discover the, the, um, the, the length and breadth of your facade prayer or is it um, setting your intention for truth? Well, it's those it's things. It's all of that, those things, yeah. is it? Yeah, and, and remember prayer is desire. So, you know, yes, like when you really desire truth, you are praying to God, please give me truth. Please give me truth. It's not like an intellectual thought that's coming out of you all the time, but it's this passionate feeling inside of you. I want the truth no matter what, no matter how hard it is, no matter how hard it's going to be for me, no matter how hard it's going to be on my emotional state, no matter how hard it's going to be in terms of processing my through emotions, through my emotions, no matter how hard it's going to be to recognise how I look in the mirror, I still want the truth. And when your desire for truth is, that, is, is large like that, then that's a big prayer that goes to God. God's going to, God's going to you know, basically... If you could think of it this way, God's going to drop everything <laughs> and just focus. He wants truth <laughs> on you wanting truth, and trust me, it's going to come at you very rapidly after that point. And that's what's the case with Mary. And when I say drop everything, obviously He does that for each of us uh, concurrently. So, but but it's like this is what God wants with us. Like God wants the relationship with us so much that God wants us to passionately desire the truth about that relationship and anything that's preventing it. And so from God's perspective, a prayer in that line, in that direction, is far more important than a prayer in almost any other direction. Does that make sense? And, uh, and that, once we engage that, you'll be very surprised how rapidly the truth is bang, bang, bang. Like Mary, Mary over the first three days of it was really just reeling in the shock of all the truth. That's how rapidly it was all coming to her, just her own memories, just things that we'd talk about, uh, my memories, and then, and then uh, her, her guides as well. She was tra channeling her guides that were reflecting on some of the things as well. And just the, the flow of truth is so rapid once you really want it. But you've got to really want it. So yeah. is it a mistake to, to use the, the realisation of the truth about your sleep state and, and sort of the revulsion that um, one might feel about that truth as a, uh, a springboard to, to actually um, generate that desire or is, or is that a flawed... Yeah, the revulsion is a judgment and we do have to, uh, you know, be careful of our judgments because it's like, it's the judgment of the truth that causes you to not really want to know it. Um, so, but how, how do you how do you get to the point where you, where you love the fact that you've been going out and, and damaging? Well, it's others? not a matter of loving it. It's a matter. Well, it is a matter of loving it, but in in a sense, it's different to what you're conceiving. You have to love the emotion that created what caused you to do it. So, so when I say love the emotion, so here's all this damage, right here. Sorry. Sorry. And. This damage is the emotion that, if we just feel it, would not create anything. It, we, do you understand? Like, if we just felt it in the moment, we wouldn't go out and act in harmony with the damage ever. But maybe we didn't even... It just came from somebody else. No, it doesn't matter where it came from, Peter. Whatever damage is within us, if we had an openness to feeling it, we would never act upon it. We would only feel it. And that, of course, would mean that we wouldn't be acting out any unloving things at all. The problem we have is this area, the shell, as Mary's been pointing out. It's the facade, the desire to maintain it, and the desire to stay in it that creates the rebellion to the damaged emotions. And it's the rebellion to the damaged emotion that creates our actions. So, so that's the problem that we face in our sleep state. A lot of the times we're in rebellion to the damaged emotion. And in our awake state, we're busily maintaining a facade that I'm okay. But in the sleep state, that's pretty hard to do when anybody can see our spirit body's condition. So, so what we finish up doing is we, go, we throw our hands up in the air in the sleep state most of the time and go, well, stuff this, it's pointless maintaining a facade. I might as well just go ahead and do what I want to do. And you do. You just go ahead and do what you want to do. And not understanding that the reason why you wanted it is because almost the flip side emotion. So the reason why Mary wants sexual power 
is because of the feeling of sexual powerlessness that she doesn't wish to feel or she hadn't wanted to feel. The reason why she wanted to engage in shame and increase her shame was because she didn't want to feel her shame. She wanted to prove that there was nothing to be ashamed of. Does that make sense? Rather than just feel her shame. And, the, and this is the biggest one for Mary, her loss. Uh, her rage about loss, actually, towards God, towards myself, even towards herself. Myself, yeah. Um, and and she, didn't, she doesn't want to feel this loss and still is struggling to feel the loss, although she's starting to get into it a bit in the sleep state. But, but what's happening is that if you deny that emotion, don't want to feel it, you're in rebellion to feeling it, now you have a problem. That is what is going to create every single action you take in the sleep state that's damaging. It, is the issue. rebellion always conscious? Are you, are you consciously aware that you're rebelling? In uh, the, you mean in the sleep it, state? In the, in the awake state. Um, in the awake state, not always conscious because you're in your facade. See, my right. fa this is why. But, I, but, I, yeah. but unfortunately, like I do feel, to be frank, that the majority of us are fully conscious of what we're in rebellion of because our law of attraction is constantly telling us what we're in rebellion of. And, and this is what's been happening for Mary yep. for four years. Her law of attraction has been constantly telling her what she's in rebellion of. And she's just saying, no, I don't want to know that, I don't want to know that, don't want to know that, don't want to know that. And many of you are doing exactly the same. Just it's, don't want to know that. It's... Um the opposite of the desire for truth is, I feel, one of the most damaging things that exists on the planet, and it's willful ignorance. And I feel that's the place where I've been. Um, what, what do we mean certain... by willful ignorance? Can we explain that? Me or them? Can we just have a mic? Wait for the mics. Uh, it's very important to understand what Mary's saying. So. Willful ignorance, what, what do we understand that yeah. to be? For me, it feels like I'm actively denying and actively trying to push it away and under and totally Why? rise above it. Why? Because I don't want to feel my shame and I don't want to feel um, what I've done and the harm that I've caused others. I yeah. just don't want to acknowledge it. So most of us are in willful ignorance. We want to be ignorant. Because the instant you no longer want to be ignorant, you want truth. And when you want truth, you always get it. God, God never hands you a snake when you pray for something else, like so some food. No? So when you're really praying to know truth, you will no longer want will for ignorance. If you're not getting truth, then you don't want it. And we need to just say, I don't want it. I'm not getting any truth in my life, so I mustn't want it. That's the best thing for us to do, is just to accept that condition. Many of us are willfully ignorant because gaining the knowledge would cause a whole series of events to occur that we don't want to have happen. And so what we do is we willfully and knowingly decide to remain above it all and not know any of it. And do you know the world, the spirit world is full in the, in the hells is full of people who are still in willful ignorance of their own actions. And we, there's something we need to get out of. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nat, a question. How are we going for time? Yeah, good. Oh, just about minutes. willful ignorance. I know myself in recent months uh, sat in a place in uh, no, uh, kind of getting a feeling about who my soulmate might be, but yeah, no, I don't want to know because of the consequence of I have to change my actions if I know that truth. I can't justify what I want to do anymore because mm. there would be moral issues involved and so it's easier to be willfully... Ignorant. So can you see where this... Now we're in the era of integrity, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. This is why if we don't want... If we want to avoid ourselves, we're not going to have any integrity. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was nice to desire truth, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, like I just feel in Mary's case, because, because of Spirit's desire to use any of the 14 to establish their own traditions and teachings further, 
in Mary's case, and because of the emotional injuries that Mary was going to have when she came to the planet this time around, Mary's received sexual projections for 2,000 years about, you know, about being a whore or being a prostitute and so forth. The majority of that time, of course, she has not been one, right? And, uh, and in the first century, it was only quite a short period of time, if you compare it with 2,000 years, that she was one. Um, be but because of these projections, uh, there's a huge amount of pain to, uh, to acknowledge about how unfairly treated we are at times. And I feel a lot of the rebellion feelings that we have are actually about the pain associated with our sense of injustice. Mm -hmm. So what we do in our sense of injustice, unfortunately, is we then perpetrate injustice upon others. And this is where we do the wrong thing. If right, We'd be better off just feeling the injustice and going deeper into the sense of injustice and feeling that rather than then perpetrating the injustice further. Because, it, because unfortunately, most of the time, we choose innocent people upon whom we perpetrate our injustice feelings. And that then causes them to feel a sense of injustice. Uh, then there's a high likelihood of them getting rebellious and then them going into a very damaging state and doing other things, damaging other people. And, uh, and this is the potential follow-on from our own sense of not wanting to feel the injustice rather than act upon it. Now, in my life, I've had a lot of uh, injustice happen to myself. And I've had, of course, in this life, a lot of feelings about that. But it's been very rare for me to act upon them. And we need to all get into that space where it's rare or, if ever, that we act upon the feelings of injustice and rather we just feel them and grieve them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that one to just... Sorry, go on, that. I was just going to say it's a pretty powerless place, that feeling that injustice. Well, that's the problem, is that, is that all rage is the addiction to power and... We, we need to understand that many of us have huge amounts of rage and huge amounts of desire to control. And in fact, we've spent most of our lives setting up a life that we can control in order to avoid a lot of things. But it's also an addiction to self-reliance. We, we don't trust God enough to go, I'm going to put you, my, myself, in your hands, God. I'm, not, I'm going to put myself and my life in your hands in the sense that I'm going to follow your laws and principles and I'm going to follow the principles of truth and love no matter how hard it is for me to do so. I'm going to follow it and any emotion that comes up as a result of me following it, I'm going to feel and not perpetrate any act of violence or emotion towards another person feeling that. Now, when we can do that, and that shift is normally around about the third sphere that that occurs, when we do that, now you, you engage all of God's laws assisting you throughout the process. And, um, and that, that's the benefit of making those kind of choices. Unfortunately, for many of us, what we do is make different choices to that. We basically say to God, I don't really trust you yet. You know, I hope you're there, but I'm not really sure. And, you know, I hope you love me. AJ is saying that you love me, and, uh, but I don't really feel that really very much of the time at all. And, um, you know, all these things that Jesus is talking about, I, I think I get at the soul level, but, but I don't like a lot of it, <laughs> really. You know, you think of it, for most of you, when you first heard some of the discussions, when you first came, how much rage was present in... in during the presentation about something that I've said. So, so you have all of those emotions. And then, and then as a result of those sort of emotions, there is this very strong resistance then to gaining further truth and knowing, you know, progressing further along the divine love path. Not understanding, and this is something I've mentioned to Mary many times, is not understanding that actually God created you perfect. God didn't make any mistakes with you. God didn't create the damage nor the facade and God knows who and what your potential is and your potential far exceeds what your facade 
considers to be your potential. Yep. And your potential far exceeds and it has the ability to overcome every tiny piece of damage that's ever been done to you is, is able to be overcome the way God's designed your soul. God didn't make a mistake designing your soul. And so, there, so God has this beautiful, has created this beautiful being that has the, the ability to conquer all sin within it. Uh, we all have this innate ability, if we engage it with God, to conquer all sin, conquer all error. And, and once we do that and realise that, and we have that kind of trust and faith in God and, and what God's created, then we won't be so adverse to discovering our true self. Right? But at the moment, many of us don't believe that, those things, and we are very adverse to discovering our true self because we're petrified that our true self is even worse than our damaged self. And that is a physical impossibility yeah. for our true self to be worse than our damaged self. Right? We also fear, like we also have this feeling, like I know for myself, my facade self wants to create this life where I feel safe and comfortable. And as I think Rob mentioned yesterday, when sometimes we connect to our real self, it has these huge desires that trigger all of our fears and we go, no, God, you didn't create me perfect. I can do it better. I, can, I know what's going to make me happier instead of recognising that it's just a fear in my damaged self that's preventing my real self from being happier than I can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, and the amount of pain in a reincarnated soul far exceeds by factors of hundreds the amount of pain in a person, a person in their first incarnation. And the reason for that pain for a reincarnated soul is a lot about the loss. The, you cannot imagine the loss. So it's impossible for anybody who's not reincarnated to imagine the extent of the loss that you experience coming back to an earth in its current state. Now in the future it may be different, but now um, coming back to the earth in its current state, the, the, the loss is so intense and yet God created the soul with the ability to even release from itself that amount of extreme pain. So, so that should give every person the confidence that any amount of pain that's within you can be released if you engage this process that God has designed for your soul to engage. Yeah. May, rather than answer some more questions, we probably want to leave the talk there. Um, what we've hoped we've done today is opened your mind and your awareness to this whole one third of your life. And also, through Mary's personal experience, demonstrated to you how much many of your locked up emotions are actually related to your denial of that life and, how, and denial of what you do in that life. And what we'd like to encourage you to do is to discover what's going on in this life. There are good things going on in the life as well, by the way. And there are negative things going on in the life. And just like there are good things going on in your day-to-day -day life here on earth and negative things going on in your day-to-day -day life on earth. And what we'd like to encourage you to do with the help of your guides and with prayer is to discover it, what's going on. Discover what you're in denial of and allow yourselves to get beyond the facade and into the real stuff. And to get beyond the facade in each state, both in the sleep state and the awake state so that you're beyond the facade and you're now in this place where you, can, where you have these qualities that Mary's crossed out <laughs> that she said she didn't have when she started. But, but the reality is faith, trust in God, integrity, desire for truth, desire for growth that those pers and persistence, those kind of qualities that we listed yesterday are going to be very essential for you in your coming months. And they will help you greatly. And what will happen is once this facade starts disappearing, so if we could just do it like this, if your facade starts disappearing in lots of areas, which it can do quite rapidly, what, what is going to be like, remember I, yesterday I described this as being like the egg white and this as being like the egg yolk. What happens when the shell goes? It's all just going to ooze out of you, isn't it? 
So instead of having to, you know, spend all of your time trying to discover what this emotion was and that emotion is and trying to work it out and asking this person, asking that person, discussing it with everybody because you have to and you, you will find the emotion will just ooze out of you, right, and just naturally flow and come out of you. The more you release these, these different facades and in the end what you'll end up with if you release most of the facade, you can see that all the damage was just going to ooze out of you and you're going to be left with the yoke. In the end, that's still this nice soft thing that has the ability now to grow. And if we could take the analogy in a bad way to another state, the yoke is the embryo of the chicken, is it not? It contains the ability, uh, it contains the genetic structure, if you like, for, for this creation, for this creature to grow. And it's very, very much the same with us. Without us connecting to this real self, true growth is not really going to be possible. This is where our real soul is. This is the thing that when you get beyond the seventh dimension and you no longer have any damage in you, this is going to continue to grow. It's going to be the only part of you that's left over, right? And bear in mind that you're a half of a soul, so half there'll a be a union of these two yokes, if you like, during this process. And the creative power in that union. Yeah. Pretty. Right? And, uh, and if you can think about it, there's a lot of things we could take as an analogy from that, isn't there? You know, with regard to even sexual union and so forth, there's a lot of patterns in there about about what happens to the soul and this is the way God teaches us through these patterns and our, our feelings are and and probably more so now Mary's feelings than before is that is that if you can be allowing of this damage and you can be honest about it and you can allow yourself to feel it as it really is rather than trying to ma maintain a facade and uh, you will rapidly then work through different damaged areas and parts of your real self will sort of be like exposed. So if this is the damaged area around here, right, and eventually you work through this damage here, now can you see what's going to happen? The real self will begin to flow. For, for many of you it will be for the very first time in your whole life that you've been your real self in one area. And then once you've worked through some more damage, now there's another vortex, if you like, where more of your real self can come out and flow. Can you see? It's going to be this slowly developing process. And it doesn't have to be that slow either. It just depends on your choice as to how rapidly it occurs. So what we hope that we've done this weekend is firstly help you work through the fact that there is the facade still in operation in many cases and also help you see that the facade creates a lot of the damaging actions you take either in your awake state or in your sleep state and hopefully today we've discussed with you this aspect of your sleep state and how getting to know what's happening in it is going to assist you greatly in your own progression towards God but you're going to need to have courage to face it because sometimes it ain't pretty that's the trouble so yeah, hopefully yeah. we've done that uh, today and yesterday just to help you with those particular things and can I just uh, thank you all for being such a beautiful audience to uh, receive my truth and I hope that it maybe inspires some courage in you to look at these things because um there is a lot of grace available when you're willing to really face yourself and, uh, and from my soulmate as well as God. And, uh, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Just thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So we look forward to the next few months and see what transpires, huh?
see what soul growth occurs. Um, Have a good sleep, everyone. <laughs> we're, we're uh, yeah, we're <laughs> or stay awake all night if that's what you want. <laughs> the um, we just we just feel that uh, myself and Mary are spending a couple of weeks again by ourselves and. Uh, because we just want to focus a lot on our own progression again. Um, so we're taking a couple of weeks away um, so that we can just focus on our own relationship without any interruptions. And, uh, and so we'll be doing that over the next few weeks after the Bracken Ridge talks. And we'd like to encourage you all to consider doing a similar thing. Just spend time... If you're in a relationship, spend time with the person in your relationship, work your way through different issues that you've been avoiding or trying to run away from or not being honest about and so forth, and let yourself work your way through those things if you can. So we'd like to encourage you to do that. We love you guys, and we look forward to seeing you again, if not next week, in a month's time. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>